Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day. It is All Hallows' Eve, October 31st, year of our Lord, 2023. I do pray this finds you safe and well on this very chilly evening compared to what it's been. Uh, 30s and that wind is blowing. It's dying down a little bit, but it is chilly. Again, I hope everybody's safe and uh, recovering from... Uh, Almost assuredly a sugar high, and uh, uh, when my kids were small, you always had the dad tax, right? You turn the kids around and collect their goodies, and uh, you know, there, there's a little, hey, uh, let me look at the bag, and uh, you know, the, the Snickers, the um, sweet tarts. I don't know why, but I really like sweet tarts. Uh, it's things you can't find anymore, like except for Thanksgiving. Uh, I used to like almond joys; they're hard to get. Anyway, reminiscing and all this sugar that. Uh, don't need anyway. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace of the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High. To herald your love in the morning, your truth, at the close of the day. Now tonight I'm departing from the daily lectionary for this evening. Now I'm going to read from Colossians. Today the church, our church, celebrates the Festival of the Reformation. Today, Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the castle church door in Wittenberg and began uh, a series of events that led to what we call the Reformation. And we celebrated that, of course, Sunday in church, and we uh, had uh, readings from Revelation and from Romans and from the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 8th chapter. But tonight I'm going to read to you, it's not one of the readings assigned for the, for the Reformation, but it captures what the Reformation is about. And it's from St. Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 8 through 15. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. You, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And this is the word of the Lord. It is a powerful word. Lord Paul just crams so much in those few senses about the nature of salvation, how you come to have that salvation, how you come to be saved. And who you are as you stand before God, who God is. It's all there. And the Reformation is still being waged today. It never ends. Today, we're not fighting. Uh, well, we still fight a lot of the same things. They didn't go away. But in the greater pale of Christianity, fighting things like emotionalism, things that God did not indicate anything about, you know, like he saved you and connect you to what Christ did. And yet, people think that somehow, Man-made things, what Paul says here in Colossians, are an indication of your salvation. They force you to look inward and not outward. So see that no one takes you captive by these things, by philosophy, empty deceits, according to human tradition. Now let me talk about emotionalism. Now, now, now the, how that became to be a mark of salvation is a long discussion, really saved for another time. What about Bible study, actually, it's a number of Bible studies to sort of unpack that and do it justice. But what simply it did was divorce the work of God from Scripture, the work of the Holy Spirit. 
and from the sacraments, which are, uh, come from Scripture, and made you look elsewhere for proof that you are saved. So, and really, you know, the, the Reformation was that as well. It looked different. It was the indulgences, penance, things like that, but the indulgences were a big one, that, that you could look elsewhere apart from the Word of God and, and you come up with another system, really another system of salvation altogether. Now, the heart of the Reformation is Christ alone. It's just, we can really just stop there. But how do we know anything about Christ? How do we know what Christ did? And how we receive the benefits of what Christ did? That's an important point right there. How do we know? It's the Word. And just the Word. Not what you feel not the philosophies or opinions of others, but the word. Now, sometimes you're going to puzzle over that word, like baptism. You know, we, uh, um, when I was reading a book today, we're, we're doing, a, in book club, we're doing, uh, Brian Wolfmiller's a very fine pastor in our, in our church, but I can't commend this book highly enough. Particularly, uh, it's a, uh, it, the book is nice, nicely uh, packed. It, I, I want to call it, entry level is not going to do it justice, but if you're not Lutheran, and you want to know why we teach the way we do, and we're not wrong to do so, read that book, As American Christianity Failed, by Reverend Brian Wolfmuller. You want a copy, let me know. I'll send you one. You know, I'll pay for it for you. Let me know. Anyway, uh, uh, it's a great book. And I was reading that today in preparation for book study. We'll be talking about it a couple of weeks from now. And he takes up this argument. You know, the whole idea is, is God doesn't want you running around because only nothing good can come from that looking for him. He comes to you. He, and he comes to you through his word. Christ is the word. Christ, yeah, that's the title we read at Christmas. He is the word, the utterance of God. You want to hear God? You look at Christ. And then you want to know how you get what Christ did, how you know you're saved. Don't look in your heart. Look to the word. What does the word say? And again, we puzzle over these things, but we have his word and we just simply say amen. Even if I don't understand it, even if it might be hard to believe. And then we cry out, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So baptism indeed does save you. It tells you that. Scripture tells you that. With the Lord's Supper, for our forgiveness, for you, we receive his very body and blood. That same body and blood that hung on the cross. And can I explain that? No. You know, is it hard to believe? Yes. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. But this is what he says. And he does these things and gives you things so you will know when you depart church that you are saved, not based on what you feel. It drives me crazy, but people do come into our church and say, your church is dead. Not that we don't have people. We have plenty of people there. But because we just kind of sit there like bumps on a log. Um, we actually don't. Uh, it might seem very rote. It's actually very rich to those on the outside. But even I find kind of disconcerting at times is that People within the Lutheran Church can't explain. They, they, they sort of offhandedly defend, well, yeah, we're just a very traditional church. No, know why we do what we do, and it's all this, bringing this comfort to you. So you walk out of that church, regardless of whether you're on an emotional high or not, and you're probably not, right? and you know you're saved. And we go right to his word, right to his word to demonstrate to you. Say in Bible study this morning, we're talking about Hebrews, another fascinating piece of God's word to read. And we're talking about, uh, it's right at the beginning of chapter 3, and the, the preacher, it's a sermon, addresses the hearers as holy brothers. And we talked about that. Well, you know, I, it, what a great privilege it is for me as a pastor to look out at a congregation. I don't have to know everybody. I've been there for a while now, knocking on the door 10 years. And you get to know the families that you see all the time. You get to know them pretty well. Um, you know, the, the heartaches, the, the joys, uh, what's going on in their lives and their extended family. Things we all have going on in our lives, you know, life in this fallen world. And yet I can look at them, and even people I don't know, and I can say, you know, holy brothers, holy people of God. We have a, a prayer that we say, it's called the proper preface, it's a technical term, but it's a, it's a prayer that we say just before, uh, at the beginning of the communion liturgy, Lord be with you, lift uh, uh, and with thy spirit, people respond, lift up your hearts, we lift them up unto the Lord, let us give thanks to the Lord our God, it's meet and right so to do, or good and right so to do, and then that proper preface, it is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places, and there's one, and we kind of rotate through them, but there's one that talks about, 
in the middle of that prayer it says, and you gained for yourself a holy people. You know, you gained, you, 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 and that's, um, we are covered with the blood of Christ. We're covered with everything he did in our baptism. And therefore, I don't, I, even though I know people's struggles, as I know mine, I can look them in the eye and, and not being facetious or silly or anything like that, say, you are holy. Now, they know their hearts and their hearts are like mine. They're going to have not so much because that holiness is outside of you. It's Christ's holiness that you wear and his perfect holiness. So you can stand before God without fear. Now look at what Paul writes here. He says, okay, no one take you captive by these other things. You know, you got to pray with your left foot in the air or you got to do all these other extra things like give your life to Christ, not found in scripture or be at a certain age, not found in scripture. Uh, or, uh, uh, pray certain prayers at certain times not found in Scripture. Christ is found in Scripture. And salvation through Christ alone is found in Scripture. But then how? How salvation? How does that come to you? Well, make, first of all, make sure no one takes you captive. So then he says, okay, for in him, Christ, all the fullness of the deity dwells bodily. Christ, fully God, right there, fully God and fully man. We confess that in the creed. The creed you know, these churches that say no creed but Christ, all right, you, uh, uh, the creed is just a summation, a very nice one of what scripture teaches, and it prevents me from going off the rails. If I start going off the rails, you have the creed. You say, wait, wait, time out, flag on the play, pastor. That's not what we say in the creed. That has saved the church more than once, let me tell you. It keeps me from coming in and inventing another gospel, which wouldn't be a gospel all, wouldn't save anybody. So he is the head and the rule of authority. We hear that at the end of Matthew. In him you also were circumcised. Now you, we don't circumcise anybody in the church. I mean, people can, for medical reasons, be circumcised. Uh, but we don't require it. So what is he talking about? It's the, and Paul doesn't require it. Because the New Testament does not require it. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. So not a physical circumcision. By putting off... Um, you're, by putting off the body of flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism. This is what your baptism does. You are joined to his death and his resurrection. You are, now, what does his death do? We're going to get to, Paul's going to get to that. But your baptism is a circumcision not made with hands because you're buried with him. You are put to death with him. He's going to, by the way, talk about that and, and to rise again. So, you are buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses, what are those, what is, and I know this is a trite example, but it doesn't mean it's not true. What does a corpse do? Nothing. You were dead in your trespasses, lifeless corpse, until made alive in Christ through your baptism where you're buried with him into his death and resurrection. You're now part of the new creation, revivified, recreated in him. So, you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive. Who did the work there? God, hello, let me repeat that. Who did the work there? God made alive. You, God made alive. How? Baptism. This is for you. This is not uh, something we do to be obedient to God, to say, okay, now we're ready. It is something God does to you to make you a Christian to make you alive in Christ. That's the Reformation. Oh, it gets even better. That's not good enough. Don't let anyone take it. You. It drives me nuts that I run into Lutherans who are quick to let this go. I have been out there, and I have been parts of churches that don't have a clear message of the gospel, and it's horrible. And it bugs me that I see Lutherans who give it up or don't want to take the time to study what we confess. It will sit in my office and say the same thing a Baptist would sitting in my office. Well, there's nowhere in Scripture where, where, where an infant gets baptized. You don't know Scripture or the power therein. Go back and read it. Don't let anyone take it from you. So, notice what he says here. He canceled the record. This is all God doing the work. He's forgiven us all our trespasses, all of them. All forgiven. Right now, this moment, your sin, all forgiven. Why? Our trespasses, that record of debt that we owe, that stood against us, the accusations, it's canceled. The record's gone, ripped up, torn. Remember what Jesus says on the cross? It is finished. Tetelestai. That's a, that's a 
it, it can be a banking term, and it's a perfect verb. Uh, it means that what he did was done for then and for all time. It is paid in full. That language, of course, is not lost on Paul, which is why he writes the way he does in this epistle. Canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Your sin was put to death in Christ. In your baptism, you are joined to that death where your sin was put to death, and you are joined to his resurrection. You are saved because of Christ alone. And we know that because this word of God tells you the whole thing from beginning in Genesis 1-1 to the very end of Revelation. It is telling you that story. How you are saved. That this is how you this is how you are loved by God. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So when Satan comes a call and whispering in your ear and telling you, you don't deserve this, you can say, Amen, I don't. But it doesn't mean it isn't true. God has done this, and he has done it for you. And you know that because you are baptized. That's how it becomes yours. What Christ did becomes yours. And in Christ, everything is yours. Life, forgiveness, salvation. That's Reformation. And it never ends. It is constantly under attack. Why? Because Satan hates what I've just said. Absolutely hates it. It's not what I said. It's what Paul wrote. Let's confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Believe in God, the Father, Almighty Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, in these dark and latter days, strengthen us that we may be delivered against temptation and the forces of the evil one that we may stand firm in our confession and stand in your word and thus uh, withstand the great attacks of the, the devil and our own sinful flesh. We ask you to be with those who are addicted and despairing of your love, that they would know of your unending love and forgiveness in Christ and turn to you and see and receive true healing. We pray for those who are tortured and oppressed, and especially those who are tortured and oppressed for your name's sake. Strengthen them, uphold them, stop the hands who inflict such evil. We ask you to be with all of us each day as we struggle with sin. Remember, help us to remember of your coming to us in the gifts of the church, that we may know of the forgiveness that is ours, and strengthen us that with repentant hearts that we may go out into the world as we struggle and, and do your good works in your kingdom. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with those who are crying out for healing. Myron, Dennis, Dave, Don, Wayne, Ardo, Klaus, Lure, Pat, Pam, Cecil, Michelle, Katie, Phil, Joe, Liberty, Don, Heather, John, Chris, Lori, Bert, Ron, Tim, Sue, Karen, Dave, Anita, Marlis, Jeremy, Dylan, Jeff, Christy, Brad, Paul, Tom, Eric, Chris, Beth, Clint, Jim, Bob, Jason, Camden, Ashley, Fern, Don, Amy, Scott, Allie, Allison, Lorena, and Cindy. Heavenly Father, place your hand upon them, keeping them ever mindful of your love. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. Into your hands I commend myself, my body, soul, all things. 
Let your holy angel be with me. The evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And tonight, I sang this. I sang this Sunday. I sang this Monday morning. Uh, the great Reformation hymn of Martin Luther's. 656, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. I'll sing all four stanzas. It is uh, based in no small part on the 46th Psalm, the Psalm appointed for this day, uh, along with uh, Romans 8, Ephesians 6, Revelation 19. A mighty fortress is our God, a trusty shield and weapon. He helps us free from every need that hath us now taken. The old evil foe now means deadly woe. Deep guile and great might are his dread arms in fight. On earth is not his equal. With might of ours cannot be done, soon were our loss effected. But for us fights the valiant one, whom God himself elected. Ask ye who, who is this? Jesus Christ it is, of Sabaoth, Lord, and there's none other God. He holds the field forever. Though devils all the world should fill, all eager to devour us, we tremble not, we fear no ill, they shall not overpower us. This world's prince may still scowl fierce as he will. He can harm us none. He's judged, the deed is done. One little word can fail him. The word they still shall let remain, nor any thanks have for it. He's by our side upon the plain with his good gifts and spirit and take they our life, goods, fame, child, and wife. Though these all be gone, our victory has been won. The kingdom has remained. Then, my brothers and sisters, I bid you a blessed rest. God's grace will see you tomorrow night. Good night.